Join us for our weekly compilation. You'll embark on an adventure filled with enthralling stories, mind-blowing discoveries, and undiscovered tales. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss out on the latest episodes. Whether you want to be entertained while working or simply want to have an interesting experience, our films are intended for you. Let the journey begin. What's the most unreasonable demand you have ever had from a roommate? Story 1. That they should get the master bedroom because they are older. Ten years or so ago, my girlfriend and I were wanting to live together. We wanted to do it properly and spend a lot of time and money getting ready, buying furniture, appliances, kitchenware, bedding, cleaning supplies, etc. All the things one needs to fill a house. Towards the end of this process, when we were actually house hunting, the idea was hatched that my girlfriend's older sister and her boyfriend should move out with us. We found a house that we liked, applied to rent it, and got in. The day of the move came, and it became apparent that both couples assumed that they would get the bigger, better master bedroom. Their argument? We're older. Our argument? We found the house, did the legwork, completed the application, and the whole thing was our idea. Their counter-argument? But you get to have the carport, and we don't. Our counter-argument? Neither of you even have a car or a license. Plus, we're supplying this house with all of its furniture, appliances, cookware, cutlery, crockery, and everything else for us all to use. You have only brought a bed, your clothes, and a TV. The TV started off in the living room, but they soon moved it into their own room, so we didn't even get to use that. Six months later, we moved out after buying a house, and they stayed. Obviously, we took everything with us when we left. They literally couldn't believe that we would be taking our own things with us. They wanted us to leave things behind for them to have. In the days leading up to us moving out, we had things packed away in boxes. They would go through the boxes, take out a knife, chopping board, pots, pans, plates, etc., and cook a meal with it. Then when I came home and asked why, they, why my packed boxes are all over the place and now need to be cleaned again, they got mad at us for packing things away. After we, let that, after we left, that place was basically empty. They didn't even have the foresight to buy a fridge, let alone all the kitchenware needed to cook and eat food. We did end up selling them the dining table and chairs as we bought a new one for our new house but they were the only chairs they had for a long while. No couch or armchairs. Not even a cushion or a beanbag. And because neither of them had a car or license, it was very difficult for them to buy things and get them to the house. But of course, this was all our fault for not donating half our stuff to them when we were just putting ourselves $220,000 in debt. They ended up breaking up. The missus and I are still together in the same house we bought with our three kids. Just because we're older. Nope, just because you're older is not an excuse, not after all the work that got put into that. Just because we're older, we have a right to your to the fruits of your labor. Nope, doesn't even doesn't even work. And it sounds like they warned them well ahead of time to get ready for this change. Nope. Story two. I have so many stories, but here is one of my favorites. I moved in with an actual crazy cat lady who was housebound because of a spinal issue and apparently at the time of my moving in hadn't been outside her front door in two years. In the ad, she indicated she was in a wheelchair. She was not and could actually still get around fine, just not quickly. She was very obese and I'm sure had some mental issues. The house was in a quiet suburban area tucked away in a corner at the end of a row, so not the easiest target for random break-ins. Despite this, she insisted I double-lock the door every time I left the house, even to go to the corner shop for five minutes while she, sat, she was sat a very few feet away in the lounge watching TV. She was pretty much never left that spot, except to haul herself to the kitchen to microwave another supermarket brand pasta pot or upstairs to bed in the early hours of the morning. One day, about a month after I moved in, 
I was in a rush leaving for work and didn't double lock the door. I came home as normal, and as I walked in, she abruptly turned off the TV and turned to look at me with a crazy look in her eye and said, You forgot to lock the door today. I told you to always lock the door. I said, Sorry, I was in a rush. I'll remember next time, etc. And she continued, I'll have you know someone broke into the house and threatened me with a knife, tried to unalive me and my cats. I questioned the details, trying to figure out if this was hogwash or not, and she kept throwing up vague answers about a man and, oh well, the police were here, but they couldn't do anything. They didn't bother writing a report, and technically nothing got stolen, but he could have easily done. You're lucky he didn't, otherwise you'd be paying for my flat-screen TV and my cats. He could have taken them. I pretty much half-baffled, half-terrified laughed at her, and she demanded I leave her house immediately for being disrespectful to her and her cat's potential unaliving. I refused, so she threatened to throw my stuff out the window, which I welcomed openly. And she shut up and did nothing. I slept with a barricade in front of my bedroom door until I moved out two weeks later, because all she did after that was mutter under her breath about hating my guts, and I was convinced she was going to stab me in the night in revenge for her cat's made-up expirations. Lock the door while she's in the house. She can't get up and lock the door herself. Or she doesn't want to. She just thinks that she's got someone that's going to do stuff for her. Nope. No, nope, I'm just, this is, I'm, it's so bad that this person had to barricade themselves in their bedroom. Have you ever had that situation where you've had to lock yourself in your room while dealing with a crazy roommate? Story three. I met my first roommate on Craigslist. First red flag. It, I wasn't allowed to keep music above volume 10 after 9 or 10 p.m. She, however, sang gospel sounds, songs, loudly, in the living room until four or five in the morning, every single day. I had to open my mail in front of her, otherwise she'd open it because it looked important. Aside from this being totally illegal, why the hell do you need to read my bank statements? She'd text me when I got an Amazon package. Oh, your shoes got here? Because she'd open it and dig around before I got a chance to. She never cleaned. Her mother still came over every weekend to clean her bedroom and bathroom. She'd let her trash accumulate near her spot on the couch throughout the week. Clearly, she didn't give a care about her living environment. But heaven forbid I put the television remote anywhere besides the right arm of the couch. I wasn't allowed to turn the heat on in the winter to save money. I live in the mountains of North Carolina, and winters are pretty harsh. She would rather freeze than pay an extra $15 per month. Over the summer, though, I wasn't allowed to open the windows, so no one breaks in. My apartment was either in the 50s and 60s or the 80s. She didn't like when I used the kitchen to cook. Weird. But she would hand wash her period panties in the kitchen sink. Even though we each had a private bathroom. Curse you, Rebecca. Her mom would come over to clean the bedroom and bathroom for her? Did her mom own the place and was just charging this woman rent? I don't understand that, and maybe that's why she feels like she has the right to do whatever she wants to in that place. Is at least the lease in her name? I kind of think that the lease is going to be in the mom's name. That's probably why. Uh -huh -huh. Story 4. Not really a demand, just an awful roommate. So I was in the dorms in college. I roomed with this dude who I didn't know. This dude played football and was about 300 plus pounds. Well, the problem is, he wouldn't shower. Ever. Like no freaking joke. Our room smelled like hot mayonnaise and B.O. I would spray and clean. Well, eventually, I got nose blind. This mother friender finally got a girl to come to the room. When she asked him why it stank, I heard him whisper, It's him. I absolutely blew up. I asked the old girl whose side looked like it would stink. 
My side was spotless while his was full of half-eaten food and sweaty clothes. She ended up agreeing and leaving. The only cleaning he did was when he would come back from practice and take off his sweaty clothes. He would then proceed to Febreze them, then go take a nap. Luckily, the room was really big. Finn, I expired inside when you said it smelled like hot mayo. You have my utmost sympathy as someone that hates mayo with every fiber of my being. And that guy sounds like an absolute douche. What's your I was the only one to get away story? Story 1. When we were 16, three friends and myself decided to book last-minute tickets to a concert. We were all pre-gaming at that friend's place that lived closest to the venue, and after a level of sufficient drunkness was achieved, we decided to head. Now, there were two ways of getting to the venue, which was held at a beach. Either take the long walk around a graveyard or, surprise, cut through the graveyard. Unfortunately, the graveyard was closed because the city didn't want people walking through it at night. But hell if that was going to stop us. So we all began attempting to climb the two-meter or six-foot, five-inch fence. My friends managed to get to the other side, but me, being the drunkest, didn't make it. As I'm struggling to get over, a flashlight appears in the distance and begins yelling something along the lines of, Hey, you! We all start, stared for a while before realizing it was a cop, so my friends booked it and left me dangling in the fence. I managed to hop down from and hide in a nearby bush. After watching my friends and the cop run away, my inebriated brain decides this is a good time to try again. Somehow, I managed to climb over and start casually strolling through the graveyard wine bottle in hand. It wasn't long before another flashlight appeared in the distance, but I was prepared. Naturally, I began running like an idiot, even managing to lose a shoe along the way and make it to one of the exits. Through a stroke of luck, me and my one shoe managed to find other friends heading to the concert. Suckers took the long way around, so I go in with them. My three other friends caught up around an hour later and began telling me how they hid behind a gravestone before the cop caught them and interrogated them about underage drinking. Luckily, I was the one carrying all the alcohol. While nothing actually happened to them, no charges, etc., they were all pooping themselves behind a gravestone for a good 20 minutes while I was having the time of my drunken teenage life. Then, everyone made fun of me for losing a shoe. Too long didn't read, friends sit in a graveyard waiting for cops to bust them while I'm getting drunk with all the booze. I do not condone underage drinking. I do not condone. But this was a charmed life experience. This man, this person, rolled natural 20s all through this encounter and just got through everything. And carried all the alcohol. Kudos. Story 2. Lollapalooza a few years back. Me and my one friend and about ten other random kids were walking around the festival looking for a place to hop the fence and sneak in because none of us bought tickets. We finally find an area where there are only a couple security guards. There were about a dozen of us that hopped this tall fence at the same time. Little did we know that the Chicago police security tent for the festival was right where we all hopped the fence. As soon as we hopped the fence, about eight cops came running out of nowhere, and at least half the group was on the ground with security holding them down immediately. This security firm had some athletic jack types. The cops get the four, the other four kids after about a 15-foot intense dash. I swear, kids were getting tackled left and right. These cops and security were literally spearing kids into the ground and shoving their faces in the dirt. It was insane. Me and my one friend made it about another half a block and ran into another fence. This whole time, two cops are chasing us. As we were hurtling the second fence, one cop grabbed my arm and tried pulling me down, and I shimmied my way onto the other side. 
we see one more scalable fence, and we hop that too. How many fences were there in this thing? At this point, we realize we're backstage for Eminem, and we head into two porta potties backstage for about 10 minutes to hide out just as the show is starting. We realize the cops have better things to do and probably quit searching for us. We head up the side stairs to Eminem and literally get on the side of the stage. Nothing better than an adrenaline-filled sprint, hopping multiple fences and making it on stage with Eminem for free. My friend's Southern Comfort pint didn't fall out of his pocket, so we had that to drink on. Nothing beats being 18 without a care in the world. It was like sneaking into prison. <laughs> Excuse me while I hop multiple fences and meet Eminem. <laughs> All right, that was a really good story as well. This was not the kind of stories I was thinking of when I saw this title. But why was it like sneaking into prison? I feel like it would be you were sneaking out of prison. What's your idea of prison like? Story three. When I was in third grade, I went to a pretty good school. But all around it were lots of low-income areas full of white families. Over the next two years... They all started to gravitate into my school. So by fifth grade inner so by fifth grade energy drinks, weapons, mainly knives, but nobody ever used them, swearing, white gangster kids, and sideways flat bill hats with the stickers still on them were everywhere. Of course, most people fell in love with UFC and WWE around this age. I did not. Sadly my friends did. And it led to some confrontations. Then one day, people in my clique started to write on a piece of paper at lunch names of kids they wanted to try to beat up at recess. I went along with it out of curiosity. Then the whole table knew about the list. And soon, the whole lunchroom. It was all we could talk about. And somehow, the list evolved into a fight at recess. The teachers tried to shut it down, but to no avail. Then at recess, around 80% of the school was at one corner of the playground in a circle, and an all-out brawl started. I wasn't in it because I had no idea how to fight, and I didn't feel like getting in trouble. All of the school staff, well, most of it was needed to stop it, and the crowd was broken up and lectures were being given. They gave out punishments to anyone who was near the fight, so a group of kids and I tried to sneak away. We were about to enter a wooded area of the playground. It was Michigan, so we had lots of these. And a teacher shouted at us to get over here. Being at the front, I quickly slipped behind a wide trunk while the others went towards the teacher and their imminent doom. Nobody even noticed me slip to the other side of the playground to avoid the teacher's. And that is how around 60 to 70% of the school got detentions and counseling, and I got off scot-free, the sole survivor in my clique. I want to know what the aftermath of this one was. Surely someone noticed that he was with their group, or this person was with their group, and that he somehow managed to elude all this punishment and detentions. Did he get any guff or did he get any praise for it afterwards? What is the aftermath? Story 4. I'm the only one left from my group of three best friends since third grade. First one hung himself because he was a pain pill addict and I think the pressure of addiction and owing a lot of people money got to him. Ate a big ton of clonopins and hung himself on his mom's Porsche with a dog leash. My wife was dating him when I met her and I always joke about it when people ask how we met. I say she was dating my friend, and I stole her, and when they ask if we are still friends, I get quiet and say he unalived himself. Second one was a horse addict. Wrecked his car badly when he nodded off, and he lived. After getting home from the hospital, he shot up again and nodded off while eating cereal and choked. His mom found him blue in the face. He lived but is a completely different person who will never be independent again. The third one 
just perished recently. He was the most baddest person ever. Had so much fun in a life he loved. He was the dude on your social media you lived vicariously through. Baddest chicks every month. Awesome road trips to Mexico one week and Alaska the next. He loved living the biker life. I couldn't even cry when he expired because he expired doing what he loved. He had literally said to me that he would rather perish on his bike than doing anything else. Anyway, this will probably be buried, but it felt good to write. I've been off substances except booze for a while now, and my wife and I are really happy. Glad I made it out of that town alive. Definitely miss my bros, though. We had some great, amazing times. This is completely different from everything else here. Sorry to hear. What's a... Let that sink in, fun fact. Story 1. Someone who works with cockroaches often develops allergies towards cockroaches. At the same time, they also develop allergies to pre-ground coffee. I don't like where this is going. I work for a large coffee roaster. When you cut open the bags of green coffee from all of those third world countries, it's amazing the things you find. Coffee is essentially dried in the middle of streets, and any number of things can end up in there. We found shoes, farming tools, huge needles for weaving the bags, 100% chance of bugs in coffee in some places. The good news? Those little guys are roasted to over 400 degrees and disintegrated by the time the roast is over. That's just protein, baby. Also heard that people that get bit by cockroaches often develop allergies for both cockroaches and shellfish. Heard of a guy in my city who bred roaches for reptile food. He was going to clean out one of the empty terrariums. He opened the hinged plastic lid too hastily, and a cloud of roach poop dust hit him in the face. Without any previous allergy, he still instantly fainted from anaphylactic shock. I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have laughed at that. Deity damn most disgusting animal on earth. Oh, and there are apparently 4,500 species of cockroach, of which only 30 are considered pests. Okay, I'm freaking out, and my skin is itching just thinking about this. I'm leaving this thread now. Yeah, best to stop thinking about things like that gap under your fridge you've been ignoring for years, or what's in all that dust under your bed. Are you trying to tell me there's ground-up cockroach in my pre-ground coffee? Or am I missing the point? Yeah, that's essentially it. Essentially, the factors where they grind up coffee generally have cockroaches that also get ground up and added to your coffee. And we were also always told of all the various stuff that gets made into hot dogs. This is just like the coffee part of it. And I've just recently started drinking coffee a little bit more and... I'm triggered. Story 2. Over the span of three days, an estimated 165 people survived both the Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear bomb attacks. Tsutomo Yamaguchi is one of the more famous ones, who was only two miles from ground zero when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. It hit when he was walking to work on the last day of a work trip. After he heard the drone of a plane, he looked up at it, and the sky lit up. He was then plucked from the ground, spun around, and tossed into a nearby potato field. Miraculously, he survived, despite being covered in burns, soaked in radiation, and with two blown eardrums. He spent a night in an air shelter, then took an overnight sleeper train home to Nagasaki to see his family. When he made it to a hospital in Nagasaki... He was so burnt that a childhood friend didn't recognize him. Neither did his family. Despite his wounds, he made it to work the next day. He started giving his boss a rundown on what happened, but his boss thought he was crazy. There was no way one bomb could destroy a city. Suddenly, a bright light lit up the room. He panicked and dropped to the floor of the office seconds before the shockwave smashed out the office windows. He had just been hit twice by a nuclear blast in the space of three days. At the age of 93, he was given the title of 
Ninju Hibakusha, or twice bombed. He expired the next year. So next time you think you're having an awful week at work, yeah. This article is a good, there's an article, a good one on him. In the life of, in the lifetime of a Japanese person, they went from samurai swords to nuclear weapons, 1867 to 1945. I don't get the boss's thinking. This guy came out, he must have heard the reports of what was going on, and he, this guy was covered in burns. And this guy didn't believe his first-hand account. Maybe he was thinking, maybe, maybe it's just proof that corporations don't actually care that much about their workers. Who knows? Story three. The Titanic had two sister ships, the Britannic and the Olympic. There was a woman called Violet Jessup, a nurse and a cruise liner stewardess that worked on all three. The Olympic crashed into a warship whilst leaving harbor, but was able to make it back. She was on the Titanic as it sank and is referenced in the Titanic film, a stewardess that was told to set an example to the non-English speaking passengers as the ship sank. She looked after a baby on lifeboat 16 until being rescued by the Carpathia the next day. It's not known what exactly caused the sinking of the Britannic, but the lifeboats hit the water too early. As the ship sank, the rear listed up and a number of the lifeboats were sucked into the propellers. Violet had to jump out of the lifeboat she was in and sustained a serious head injury, but survived. She was on board for all three incidents in the space of five years. She went back to continue to work at sea for another 30 years before retiring in 1950. She passed away of heart failure at 71. When the Britannic was sinking, she returned to her cabin and grabbed her toothbrush because that is what she missed most after the sinking of the Titanic. Another fun fact, Captain E.J. E. J. Smith, captain of the Titanic, was also the captain of the Olympic when it collided with the Hawk. Three literal sink-in facts. Three literal sink-in facts. What a bad one. What a bad one. Her portrait should be associated with the phrase, getting back on the horse. Or she was a master saboteur working for the Cunard line. Don't know about that one. I voice some other channels, top 20 and stuff, and there's a lot of Titanic information. This story is mentioned a lot. Actually, the previous one is actually mentioned a lot in other lists about astonishing facts. I'm wondering if this one is going to have some more overlap in some of my other work. Let's see. Story 4. When NASA pitched the idea of the Voyager missions to Richard Nixon with the idea of touring the outer planets, he was told that the last time it was possible, Thomas Jefferson was in the White House. The particular planetary alignment that Voyager 2 used on its journey occurs only once every 176 years. Jefferson really dropped the ball. Curse Louisiana. We could have sent Lewis and Clark to Mars. That was apparently literally what the guy proposing it said to Nixon. Mr. President, the last time this was possible, Thomas Jefferson was sitting where you are, and he really dropped the ball. Nixon laughed and partially approved the mission. He was told that the last time it was possible, Thomas Jefferson was in the White House. My dumb brain was sitting there thinking, they didn't have space travel in the 1800s. But you meant planetary alignment. We didn't have space in the 1800s. Story 5. It took humanity approximately four times longer to switch from copper swords to steel swords than it took to switch from steel swords to nuclear bombs. When will we get nuclear swords? Are you discussing the option of a more elegant weapon, perhaps for a more civilized age? And it took humans approximately 50 times as long to switch from stone tools to bronze than it did to switch from bronze to firearms. Imagine you're a vampire. You go to sleep in the early 1700s. Muskets and stuff. Meh. You wake up in 1945, and humans have the ability to wipe an entire city off the map in an instant. Time to nerd out hard. This is a major theme in the role-playing game Vampire the Masquerade, if you're playing an older character. The idea that you were once an immortal deity-like being that now has to contend with food that can unalive you. 
Story 6. Oxford University is actually older than the Aztecs. Interesting. The University of Oxford, informally Oxford University or simply Oxford, is a collegiate research university located in Oxford, England. It has no known data foundation, but there is evidence of teaching as far back as 1096, making it the oldest university in the English-speaking world and the world's second oldest university in continuous operation. It grew rapidly from 1167 when Henry II banned English students from attending the University of Paris. After disputes between students and Oxford townsfolk in 1209, some academics fled northeast to Cambridge where they established what became the University of Cambridge. The two ancient universities are frequently jointly referred to as Oxbridge. The Aztec Empire, or the Triple Alliance, began as an alliance of three Nahua Altopetl city-states, Mexico Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan. These three city-states ruled the area in and around the Valley of Mexico from 1428 until the combined forces of the Spanish conquistadors and their native allies under Hernán Cortés defeated them in 1521. Yep, these stories are still aligning with some of the stuff that I do on other channels, but you know what the really difficult part of all this is? Having to look up all these pronunciations. I had to look up Tenochtitlan and Tlacopan. I didn't know if it was Tlacopan, Tlacopan. I had to look that up. That's the one that always kind of slows these down. Let's keep going. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. Girls, how do you know when a guy is genuinely good and not just trying to get into your pants? Story 1. Watch his behavior. A genuinely good guy will invest his time in you. Even if he's been busy, he'll reach out to see how your day was because he cares. Want to learn things about you. It won't be superficial facts. He wants to know about who you are, your hopes, family, the things most important to you. Support you. He'll want to know your hopes, dreams, and ambitions. For example, you need to study and there's a party he wants you to go to with him. If you tell him your studies are more important, he won't pressure you or guilt trip you for not going. Shows you off. He'll want to go on dates, post pictures of you or with you, tell his friends and family about you. He doesn't want to confine you to only his apartment or bedroom. Engage in meaningful conversations. He'll try to connect on more than just a physical level. It will be intellectual and emotional. A lot can also be said from a guy's language. Listen for the way he speaks. Does he say you're beautiful or puts you down? You should do more squats, only talks physically intimately about your looks. Watch his eyes. There's a difference between a loving look and a lustful look. Keep in mind that everyone has flaws. Nobody is perfect. To expect anyone to complete a checklist on a daily basis is excessive. We're human. Mistakes happen. But with a genuinely good man, it won't be an everyday occurrence. He'll care and always strive to improve. These are just a few differences that I've noticed about the players and the man who treats me like a princess. Hope it helps you. Best of luck. You'll meet your Prince Charming. And this is one where commenting for me is going to be difficult as a guy. I can only think of it from my perspective. A lot of those can be flipped around to a girl's, to, to know when a girl's is girl is interested in you or if they're just after something from you. And I don't see anything wrong with uh, what they're trying to look out for either. Story two. I knew my husband was a keeper. He had been my friend first, but we lost contact because he had a crazy girlfriend. When we reconnected, she was officially his ex-girlfriend, but I had an emotionally abusive fiancé. He talked me out of it. He helped me get the courage to leave, and then he waited for me to heal. I gave him no time frame. I told him that I needed to be single before I made another commitment because he deserved to have all of me and be more than a rebound. Neither of us saw other people. We talked every day. 
I told him he didn't have to wait, but he insisted. When we saw each other again for the first time, he was an OTR truck driver. It clicked. We were meant to be. He switched to regional driving, I went back to college, and now we're building our lives. Seven years together, four married. That one was really a roller coaster. There is just such a connection there that they both felt like they committed to. I don't know, they both, in a way, they both kind of felt like they waited for each other. What do you think? You think that's going to work for anybody in that kind of situation? I'm not sure it does. Story three. I once met a girl in an outlet mall and we got to talking for a while and eventually it got late and dark. I'm kind of a shy guy, so I hesitated a bit, but I asked if she needed a ride to her car. It was dark in a big parking lot, so even though I was interested in her, I also felt obligated to make sure she was safe. She actually said no because she wasn't that far, and I just followed up with if it was okay for me to at least walk her to her car, and she said yes. We got to her car, and I asked for her number, and she shyly smiled and was like, um, and I got the hint right away and said, I get it. It's cool. Thanks for hanging out. Have a great night. Smiled and turned to walk away. I get a few steps and I hear her open her door, but then she goes, wait, wait. I stop and turn and joke, nope, too late. She laughs and I walk over and we exchange numbers. We dated for six months and sometime during that, all she told me that how chill I was about being rejected made her instantly like me. And not in a pity way. She just realized I wasn't going to treat her like dirt if she turned me down. I've had to deal with that a bit too, you know. Just be able to not pressure a connection or pressure a phone number. Just if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And if that person says no, just move on. It's just not worth obsessing over. It's kind of a hard lesson to learn. Story four. Guy here. Everyone is an a-hole about something. Grammar Nazi goes on and on about the difference between Star Trek and Star Wars, obnoxious about sports, obnoxious around politics, snobbish about beer, crossfitter, gamer, etc. Most of us learn to be civil about our buttholery. We learn to manage it and recognize that it's kind of unacceptable. We apologize for it but we don't hide it. If he can't find a guy's butthole, metaphorically, stay with me, he's definitely not a nice guy. So much for this. I've always held the opinion that all girls are crazy and all guys are buttholes. If the guy doesn't know what kind of crazy the girl is, or the girl doesn't know what kind of butthole the guy is, the relationship is a ticking time bomb. Story 5. I found a really good checklist to be. 1. Is he trying to elicit a specific behavior or response from me, or is he being sincere? 2. Is he focused on how this situation affects him, or how it affects me and the people around him? Example. I've had both good guys and nice guys tell me they had feelings for me. The nice guy says, I just don't understand why you won't go out with me. Like, what else could I do? You're the perfect girl for me. You don't know how hard it is to see the perfect person for you and not be able to have them. The good guys said, Since we're friends, I think I owe it to you to be totally honest and tell you that I've started developing feelings for you. You don't have to reciprocate or say anything right now. I just wanted to be up front so things don't get weird later. Story 6. It's generally easiest to tell through how they treat people differently. But seeing them learn about your relationship status is obviously a shortcut if it's available for you. It's always a bummer when you're having a great time with a group of people and a guy you were hitting it off with, platonically in your view, learns you're in a relationship and immediately starts to ignore you. It always really makes me sad. Not that it happens a ton. I'm not a smoke show or anything. It's like, oh, I guess I'm just not as funny and interesting as I thought I was. That person didn't actually enjoy our conversation, and he was just working on a potential lead. It really brings you low as a woman to see that guy continue to enthusiastically socialize with the other guys in attendance after he stopped talking to you upon discovering your unavailability. 
Hmm, that can happen. I think there are some guys that are out there looking, and I do think that I do think that it is rude. A lot of guys will just ignore that girl once they find the situation. I mean, you could say the joke that, okay, girls will do the same thing to guys if they find out that he doesn't have any money or something like that, the typical trope. But I do think that it's possible to just switch gears and, you know, not just be totally binary about, oh, I'm really interested in you or I'm just going to ignore you once I know your status. I think that's something to adjust, something to aspire to, to be totally cool with and be able to still be friends with this person. Story 7. When my boyfriend and I officially started dating, we had spicy time that night and I ended up sleeping over. Before a single piece of clothing left my body, he made eye contact with me and said, If at any point you feel uncomfortable, tell me to stop. I tell you what, that was the biggest deity dang turn on of my life. Been together about a year and a half and live together now. That reminds me of my boyfriend and I, when he asked me on three different occasions if I wanted to have intimacy. First it was no and we kept kissing. Then it was yes, but no because I want to take my time and it's late. Then it was like, dang, yes, let's do this. Aren't our boys amazing? Story 8. Stage in life. Does he talk about settling down with someone? Does he associate that someone with you? Personality. How does he behave around his close friends? What do they talk about? Does he keep his promises? If you're sick, is he by your side? If you want to see him more often, does he make an effort to compromise? Reputation. Is he known in the friend circle for being a player? Previous relationships. Does he have previous long-term relationships? Did he have stages of one-night stands? Cheating history. Did he ever cheat before? How does he respond to your needs and wants? If you're allergic to some food, does he avoid bringing that food near you? Soldiers. What was something that was so funny even the drill sergeant couldn't help but giggle? Story 1. PV2 Thomas had been a problem since basic training when he acted as patient zero for a particularly virulent strain of crud and pink eye. He had been the only person to fail his Phase 4 inspection because no one wanted to fail the inspection that would give you back some basic semblance of freedom, such as being allowed to leave the barracks area on the weekend or getting to skip the hour-long bed check. His explanation in that case had been that he had been playing Magic the Gathering in the day room with his friends. Usually a failure was shared by the entire room, but that time the drill sergeant let it pass. The drill sergeant himself had a glorious bushy mustache, the kind that would be proud to sit atop Sam Elliott's lip and spoke with a labored drawl. In addition to the usual stock phrases common to all drill sergeants, I've got games privates, games for days, I've got games, I've got more games than Milton Bradley, he had a few of his own. It ain't rocket surgery, desert dogs, may as well have been the platoon motto. The thing about initial entry training is that there's a formation for everything. Even when you're deep in phase five and so close to graduation that you don't even know if you remember how to be a real person, you spend much of your day standing at arm's length from three or four other people. By that point, the last formation of the day was mostly used to hand out information, having long since moved out of being yet another trap designed to send some portion of the platoon to a session in the grass. The grass contained no grass or any other discernible form of plant life. One such tidbit was that thanks to the war, the army was finding itself short on trained linguists. If anyone in the platoon could speak another language, other than Spanish, and could pass the, DOI, the DLI test, we'd be eligible for a $100 a month bonus. PV2 Thomas raised his hand, and when called upon, asked, Does Klingon count, drill sergeant? The drill sergeant blinked and stared, not saying anything. The fury we would have expected a month earlier never came. He just stared, his mustache twitching at the corners. The platoon didn't move, didn't even dare to breathe and none of us were quite certain that we'd heard the question correctly. 
No, the drill sergeant finally rumbled, a smile finally peeking out from his mustache. Klingon does not count. He started to go on to the next item, but shook his head. Just push, Thomas. Push until you expire. He rattled off the rest of what he had to say and dismissed the rest of the platoon. I went into the barracks to change clothes, and as I headed towards the DFAC, I passed Thomas raking neat lines in the non-existent grass, shouting various words in Klingon as the drill sergeant requested them. And now I'm wondering if Klingon speakers could be used for encoded communications, like the Navajo Code Talkers. The Navajo Code Talkers. The Code Talkers, yeah? Well, I don't know. As far as made-up languages go... Maybe it would be uh, Valerian these days, but then you'd have the question about whether it would be High Valerian or Low Valerian. Story 2. 1995. Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Misery. Halfway through basic. Just finished up lunch at mess hall, and about ten of us are waiting outside. Information for the rest of the company. Delta Company marches up, flies into mess hall. Last guy runs past us, and one of our guys says in drill sergeant voice, Where do you think you're going, Private? You don't run in front of another company. Delta guy pauses, then continues on, when Delta drill sergeant marches over with, Who said that? Mouths agape, not wanting to rat out our guy, but not wanting to do push-ups after lunch either. We all look around silently. Drill sergeant, who said that? Us. Drill Sergeant, who said that? Private A, slowly raise his hand. Us, staring. Drill Sergeant, come here, privately. Who do you think you are? Beat your face, Private. Beat your face. Private, eyes go wide. Long pause. Drill Sergeant, you hear me? Beat your face, Private. Private, looks at hands, then back at Drill Sergeant. Drill Sergeant, beat your face. Us, silently imploring him. Private looks at his hands and back at Drill Sergeant again. Drill Sergeant steps closer. Private starts punching himself in the face hard. Us, what the hell? Drill Sergeant trying to hold back laughter. Whoa, 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 Private, hold on. You don't know what beat your face means? Private A shakes head. Drill Sergeant. Push-ups, son. Push-ups. Give me ten. This would be me. This would be me, too. I think maybe these two were from two different places where Beecher... I don't know how common Beecher Face is, to be honest. How common is that in the service? Is it possible to go through basic training and not know what Beecher Face means? Story three. We were all sitting in the classroom cleaning our weapons when the drill sergeants rushed in and told us to form up outside now. We all bust butt to get the outside line up and ready to go. Couple of minutes later, the drill sergeant comes out holding a deity damn rifle. One of our air wasters left his freaking rifle inside the classroom. Which one of you slack-jawed numbnuts doesn't have their rifle? The soldier identifies himself and he's called up and directed to smoke all of us. Beautiful thing about the army. You mess up, and everyone else pays for it. So he's up there about to smoke us, but instead, he's just frozen. Eyes as big as saucers. Well, what'll it be, Gomer? Silence. Drill Sergeant is ticked and gets in his face and tells for a minute, Now get at it, he concludes. The soldier is frozen, but the silence is broken. The soldier lets out the longest and most cartoonish fart I've ever heard. We all do our best to stifle our laughter as we prepare for the hell show that's coming. Drill Sergeant says nothing, though. Then he cracks a smile. Get the hell back inside, now! Forty rounds, drill sergeant. At least he gave the air back. (laughs) I guess that was saving grace for him. 
and for the whole platoon, just somehow making someone laugh so much that, all right, we'll let it slide for now. Hopefully that was, <laughs> I wonder if he learned how to do that on cue to try and get out of other situations after that. I'd probably learn how to do that if that got me out of situations. Story four. We had a kid whose name was Lackey. I kid you not. Lackey looked like an egg had grown stubby arms and legs and a head, but no neck. He was whiny, dumb as hell, and talked like a robot who smokes a pack a day. He probably had some kind of learning disability, but was pushed into RTC by a recruiter trying to meet his quota. Should not have been there. Anyway, this kid couldn't do any physical activity to save his life, and usually refused to try. One day, while we were being beaten for who knows what, our oldest, meanest, saltiest RDC absolutely had it with this one day and started verbally berating this kid trying to get him to do just one push-up. Lackey starts getting all panicky and flustered, but still wouldn't even try to do a push-up. Lackey finally blurts out, I can't. I'm gonna have a heart attack. Our RDC responds without missing a beat. That's okay, Lackey. I know CPR and just starts rhythmically stomping his foot on the ground, implying that his version of CPR will be done with his foot, not his hands. Lackey, staring at the floor in the push-up position, is absolutely scared to unaliving, and lets out the nastiest-sounding, wettest fart I have ever heard. We all are desperately trying not to laugh, but we all make the mistake of looking at the RDC, who is literally gagging on the smell. We all lost it, including the other two RDCs in the room. The laughter did die off once we got a whiff of Lackey's fart. I seriously smelled like a small rodent perished in his butt. Needless to say, Lackey did not make it through boot camp, which is probably a good thing for him and the U.S. Navy. We had a guy like that when I went through BMT. Wound up getting discharged after his fourth week. Apparently, he was abused intimately as a child, and his mental state wasn't all there. People often advise, don't burn any bridges. But what's a bridge you were happy to burn? Story 1. My abusive ex-girlfriend. It's been six years now, and it's still hard thinking back to it. I was a big, muscular guy dating this petite cheerleader. If someone was told that there was an abusive relationship going on between us, Never in a hundred tries would someone guess she was the abusive one. For people who say ignorant comments like, just leave her, or things like that clearly don't understand. Every day you're being told that nobody else would ever want you, and you're lucky to have a girlfriend as great as she was. Your father should be ashamed of who his son is. I don't know why anyone would waste time on you, etc., you feel so dependent on that person because you feel like there's nobody else who would ever love you and you're going to be alone forever if you leave. It was mostly verbal or emotional abuse, but sometimes it did lead to physical abuse. On days I felt that I could walk away from her comments, she would come slap me, hit me, and she even hit me with a metal bat. This tears a person down so much you just can't do anything. The only way that I was able to leave her was that I completely accepted that if I left her, I probably wouldn't ever find anybody else to ever care about me at all, and I would always be alone. I was okay with that, rather than being with this girl any longer. It was the absolute hardest thing I ever had to do. More and more comments about how I'll never find anybody or ever be loved, how I should unalive myself if I do actually leave because it will only be worse living without her. I blocked her on every social media, her phone number, everything save an actual legal document making her stay away, and I just felt numb. She showed up to my house multiple times, but I never went to the door to see her. It took three years before I let someone back into my life romantically, and it was a complete blessing compared to what I was in. I eventually broke things off with her, just because we never saw each other. But as of four months ago, I've been engaged to my girlfriend of two and a half years and are getting married next June. She is the greatest thing that ever happened to me, 
and the only person who I've ever been able to talk to about that relationship. I'm so grateful to have her in my life. I wouldn't be the person I am today without pushing, without her pushing me through college and now supporting me through med school as well. Because I burned that old bridge when I did, I was able to move away to college and meet my future wife. I do not regret any part of what I did, and I truly hope that my old abusive ex sees what she has done and changes into a better person. She has two kids with different fathers now, and I certainly wish that she will never treat those children how she treated me, and they can grow up and live great lives. That last statement feels a bit ominous. I really hope those kids do turn out well. And as for this person, it's amazing that there was a new person and the only person that he was able to share this type of relationship with. Out of everybody in this person's life, it was only that one person he felt good talking about. It's amazing that he's found who he's found. Story 2. I worked on the railways on an agency contract. I had a week off, sick, unpaid, because I'd worked 12-hour shifts for nine days straight, and my body just shut down. Phoned in and okayed it with the boss, went to my GP, doctor, and had a blood test. Turned out, I was anemic and I'd lost weight. Probably because of the long shifts and lack of proper food on the short breaks at work. I came back a week later, and I was told in no uncertain terms that if I had any more time off sick, I needn't bother coming back. I had no employment rights because technically I was on a zero-hour contract, even though it was rare for me to work anything less than 45 hours a week. So I pretended for a few weeks that I'd forgotten that comment. I then booked all of the allocated holidays in one go, all three weeks of it. Because it was out of peak season and there were no strikes planned, they could do nothing but accept my request. A few days before the end of my holiday, I sent an email to the HR department at the agency explaining that I'd like two more weeks off, unpaid, because I was cut off from the country. Again, can't deny me that because I claimed to be out of the country and unable to return, and I was on zero hours. Two weeks later, and the night before I was due to return to work, I faxed them my resignation, stating I was leaving with immediate effect. That way, they would only read it first thing the next morning when I was supposed to arrive for my shift. They then had to locate somebody urgently to replace me. I did this because the agency paid us two weeks in arrears, and the contract states that if you don't give two weeks' notice before you resign, you forfeit all money owed to you. But because I'd just had two weeks off unpaid, they had just paid me for the second and third week of my allocated paid holiday. They didn't owe me any money, and so they couldn't withhold anything from me. I knew the boss was annoyed because I received my P45 attached to an email, and in the email it said that, because of my disregard for their resignation policy, they are unwilling to provide an employee reference to any future employer. Joke's on them. I left to become self-employed. The contract states that if you don't give two weeks' notice before you resign, you forfeit all money owed to you? I don't think this is illegal. I don't think this is legal, actually. I'm almost sure it isn't in California. There is just so much in California, or just any place, where they will lie to you about what they owe you and about what is expected of you. And I remember that from working in California in a lot of stuff, and I was doing a lot of freelance work. So just read the employment policies and read the laws where you are about what is actually legally required they do to pay you. This person just worked the system hard. Story 3. I'm on good terms with all but one of my exes. Some are even pretty good mates now. All of my exes have one thing in common, and it's that all of them cheated. By But time and moving on has allowed me to get over the hurt and have most of them still in my life in one way or another. Except... One, 
My very last one I know I just can't be a bigger person about. He went to Thailand for a boy's trip about a month after we started dating. He'd call me every single day saying how much he missed me, etc. One of those days being Valentine's Day. When he got back a few weeks later, he said that being apart from me made him realize he never wanted that again and proposed. I was a little taken aback, but I was in my late 20s then. He treated me really well and was working. Yes, bonus. So I said we should definitely consider it after our honeymoon phase wore off. Several times over the next several times over the next 12 months, he would bring it up, and then one night he did it formally, and this time I said yes. But aside from planning a wedding, he became really into Walter White crystals and he changed as a person, completely paranoid and overbearing. So I broke it off six months later. That's when he told me that all those months ago in Thailand, he had cheated on me with several different women, including one on Valentine's Day. He had felt guilty, and that's why he had proposed, and every time he started feeling bad, he would bring up us getting married. Hell, that hurts. Aside from that, the paranoia from the illicit substances resulted the next couple of months after breaking up with him stalking me, following me home from work, which was over an hour's trip with a train and bus, heaps of prank calls, getting his family to call me, asking me to reconsider. Then the desperate evolved into threats and blackmail. But as soon as he got my family involved into a topic of a threat was when I flipped at him. Yes, I'm pretty patient. I try reasoning and being rat anal. Even in his drug-fueled altered state of mind, he knew me losing my cool was a big deal and he backed off. I honestly hope I never see him again. I'm still put off finding someone because of him. What a butthole. Six months after he started becoming an addict. I am patient for a lot of things, and I probably could not speak for this person's state of mind, but I could not wait. I could not be six months with someone getting into that. I don't drink. I don't do anything like that or even smoke. I'd have no patience for it. I'm surprised six months was what she gave. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.